thank you very much for all being here, and it's a pleasure for me to, to get this going. Um, so basically what I would like to do is tell you a story about two ecologists. I'm doing it with the guy standing behind of me, Ian Pinko, from Singapore. How we got involved in using drones for conservation. And this story starts with orangutans, so we'll start with orangutans as well. I started my journey with orangutans about 20 years ago when I first set my footsteps in the forest of North Sumatra in Indonesia. This is a pretty exciting place for a young student to go to because at any time you can meet an elephant in the forest, a tiger, which I did a few times and luckily survived, or even a rhino, which I never met because they're so incredibly rare. Um, but I was there to study orangutans. Orangutans are arboreal species. They spend most of the time very high up in the trees, so you actually virtually never get to see them as well as in this picture. Normally, you're staring up all day like this, and you see them somewhere there. So you get a lot of neck pain when you start working with this species. Um, so when I started, science was saying that orangutans were one species with two subspecies, one on Sumatra, one on Borneo, and that behaviorally, all orangutans were roughly having the same behavior. Wherever you went, it might be a little bit different, but in general, their behavior was thought to be the same. A few years later, though, geneticists and morphologists suggested that orangutans are not all <coughs> one species. There's actually two species, one on Sumatra and one on Borneo. And on Borneo, there's three subspecies. And their ranges are depicted with the different colors here. So that brought a bunch of orangutan field biologists to the question, well, are these species really behaviorally similar, or might they be much more diverse than we ever anticipated? So we all started to share field notes, and out of that came some pretty amazing discoveries. Orangutans are very, very different in different populations. So in some populations, for instance, they might use sticks to pry honey from tree holes. They might use sticks to pry seeds out of thorny fruits. Or if they bump into a tree with spines on the trunk, they put leaves in the palm of their hand and climb the tree trunk. And in other populations, they don't. And this behavior is learned, so they have something that's quite similar to what we consider as culture. And it even goes into dialect, which for every, anybody living in the UK is something very common, all these dialects. But for people studying orangutans, it was quite interesting to discover this. So, for instance, if a mother in North Sumatra calls her infant, that would be the way to do it. Whereas if you move to Borneo, you hear something very different. So we're discovering that orangutans have a lot of variation and it's very informative for studies on human evolution and to understand human language, the rise of culture, etc. But at the same time, we're also losing them. There's a lot of logging going on in many areas where I've worked now look something like this. So very different from, from when I started. And that first picture that I took, that area has been logged as well. So these areas are disappearing, and that's a problem for conservation people. Because to conserve the species with all this rich diversity, we need to conserve them in many, many places, not just a thousand or two thousand. We need to conserve the diversity. And for that, we need to know where they are and how many of them there are. And that's a huge challenge. Normally, we try to tackle that by slogging hundreds of miles through the forest. Uh, we eat basically dry rice and very deep fried fish. Um, we cross bridges if they're there, and a lot of time we spend in the water going from forest area to forest area. This is great fun for a biologist, but it's not very effective. We did a survey of all these red dots in Sumatra over the last three years. It took us three years. It cost us a lot of money. And a little bit frustrating for an orangutan biologist is that you don't even get to see the orangutans. They're so, 
they live in so low densities that you only see the nests that they build every day, and we derive the densities and their whereabouts from the nests. So when Leon Pinco and I were discussing the ongoing habitat loss and the need to monitor them, we thought, well, what if you could put a camera on a little plane, an unmanned plane, and it would just fly over the forest and take pictures of the nests and the orangutans. We would have dry feet and the drone would do all the work. <coughs> so we started to look into what drones are used for outside of the military business. And there are some civilian applications for it growing more and more. But to buy an off-the-shelf drone is still quite expensive. And ecologists and conservation people don't have that much money, so we had to build one ourselves. So we went to look around on the internet, how do you build a drone? And there's a website, do it yourself drones. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you all the information and even two ecologists can build a drone. So we built a prototype for less than 650 uh, pounds. A very simple hobby plane, small autopilot, a camera. And we started to test it in Switzerland during the summer, during the winter, I don't know why, because we were going to test it in the, in the tropics, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So once we felt a little bit confident that it would work uh, all right, we took it to the tropics and flew it over the forest. It was quite exciting to see if it worked, and it did. It flew beautifully over the forest, took some fantastic video footage which we were quite pleased about and on top of that it took actually pictures of the animals we were looking for it was flying and we had a picture of an orangutan pictures of their nests and it basically on the, f the first flight or the first flights that we did it did what we normally would do in three days on foot in the forest in 20 minutes and we could just all stand there, have a cup of coffee, <laughs> the drone and the work, all very nice and comfortable, and very effective, because it costs more money to send people into the forest and do that work, and actually send them the plane in. On top of that, it turned out that the plane camera was pretty good at taking pictures of logging in the forest, uh, land use, such as oil palm, which is a big threat for orangutans because, of, because a lot of the forest gets uh, changed into uh, oil palm lands. We also took pictures of other species, so we thought, well, there might be more applications than only orangutans. Um, so we were very enthusiastic about this and thought, well, let's spread this idea to the conservation community and start a website, Conservation Drones, where we share what we do, what drones we use, the technology, the projects we have, and people started to like it, and we got quite a few hits so far. So how does, how does a conservation drone work? Well, it's very simple, basically. There's a piece of open source software that has a Google map in it, and you click where you want the plane to fly, and you load that mission up to the autopilot, and you can do very simple missions like this. This is in Sabah, in Malaysia. You have certain spots where you want the drone to fly to. You click those on the map and you load it up to the plane. Or if you're more interested in land mapping and you want to have a detailed map of the area that you're covering, you can make a grid flight and you load that up. And then once it's loaded up, you take it to the field, put a battery in, it's just a normal LiPo battery like in your laptop. You launch it, you sit back, and it will land automatically, and the mission is done. You take out the camera, you look at the pictures, and that's it. So it's quite simple. Um, so what is it really good for, in addition to the photos that I've already shared with you? Well, it's certainly good for taking pictures of animals. These are two rhinos uh, bathing in a river in Chitwan National Park in Nepal. Um, but it's also good to take pictures of landscapes and stitch them together into a larger mosaic that has a lot of detail and that you can then, for instance, put on Google, uh, Google Earth and have a lot more detail 
than the satellite images that you normally get. And satellite images are great, but the resolution is still quite low, about 50 centimeter per pixel. And with these pictures from the drones, you can go down to, you can go down to the tree level and actually recognize different tree species. This is a study we're doing in Gabon uh, to look at tree species and chimpanzee distribution. We're also uh, making pictures of chimpanzee nests there. So you get an enormous amount of detail from these cheap uh, drones that can fly over a forest. You can also stitch them together and then turn them into a three-dimensional representation of the forest, which is very helpful for ecologists that want to look at their forests in this way. You can also put a video camera under it, as you've already seen, and you can take beautiful pictures of the landscape. And on top of that, you can also make it a really effective tool to combat uh, forest fires and to combat, for instance, bush bee hunters that go into the forest. These people go into the forest, they dry the meat of the animals that they catch in the forest, but the smoke gets through the canopy. And you can actually detect with the drones where the smoke is and then you can send in patrol teams to find these poachers uh, and try to stop them. So that's something that they're very useful for as well. <laughs> yeah. We're also starting to experiment with thermal imaging cameras. This is just a really first start, so it's not very good. The resolution is quite low, but it's something that a lot of conservation people are interested in because they want to be able to detect animals at night and people at night that go into national uh, parks. Um, so we're, we're trying to improve upon this. Another idea that we have to work on this is to have camera traps in the forest or in any area that would send up their images to the drone. The drone would collect all the images and fly around back to you and love to have that information. In addition, sorry. Um, we're thinking about if animals that have collars around their neck and are in, in forests or other habitats, it would be really great if you can locate these animals with a drone instead of going on foot with a giant antenna to try to find them. So that's another thing that we're trying to, to develop and all this information should then go to your computer and that would be an enormous help for our conservation projects. As you can imagine, as these planes fly around, we get a large amount of photos, much more than we would like to check manually. So we're trying to work on automatic object recognition. So for instance, we're now fairly good at detecting orangutan nests automatically in trees with some software, but not with elephants or other species. So there's a lot of, of work that we're, we're trying to, to do uh, with other people because it's not our expertise and try to make this on the on the analytical part very efficient for conservation and research people as well. So where did we go from that first flight with orangutans in Indonesia? We now have projects in Saba and forest ecology, several mammal species, projects on um, mainland Malaysia on elephants, rhinos in Nepal, wolves in Germany, chimpanzees in Gabon and tree species, turtles in Gabon, national park uh, protection in, in Congo, illegal logging in Madagascar. That's where we've been flying them since, since, the, since a little bit more than a year ago when we started. Uh, and we have a lot more requests and discussions going on with people that would like to work with us and have drones fly uh, for their particular purpose. So for instance, we're working with people in, in Northern California to see if it can be used for killer whales. We're talking to people in the UK if they can be used to count barnacle bees up in the north of England. So there's a lot of potential there for a, a wide variety of conservation uh, people to use it. And the conservation community has reacted very enthusiastically uh, to, to embrace the uses of a technology that comes from, from a very different corner for a conservation purpose. And we hope that we can work with a lot of people to, to develop this technology further, that it becomes even cheaper, more easy to use, 
uh, in all aspects for the conservation and research community. Thank you very much. <laughs>